Hello friends and welcome to another video lecture on organic chemistry. This is topic S2.4 from Models 2 Materials. We are going to look at the polymerization of organic molecules. Regarding question, what role do bonding and structure have in the design of materials? Again, we're looking specifically at polymers. Our only understandings for this particular lecture are here. If you want the first three understandings from this topic, those are a separate video. I'll link it in the comments. Our objectives, we're going to look at so much vocabulary. We're going to talk about polymerization via addition reactions. We're going to look at some monomers and figure out what polymer we could make from them. We're also going to look at some polymers and figure out what monomers made them. We're going to talk about the properties of different examples of polymers. Knowing those properties will allow us to choose the right materials for our different designs. And then we're also going to look at the impact of synthetic polymers, plastic, on the environment. And as promised, so much vocabulary. Polymers are very large molecules that are made from chains of monomers. Here's a polymer. Here are my monomers. When I chain them together, we have a polymer. Polymers are macromolecules. That just means it's a really big molecule. Some of our polymers are synthetic. They are man-made. Examples are plastic and nylon. But we also have some naturally occurring polymers. These are biological in nature. DNA and starch and protein are all examples of natural polymers. And as I stated earlier, monomers are those single subunits that make up the polymers. If I put a pair of monomers together, that's a dimer. We can also have trimers and tetramers and octamers. These will get put together in today's lecture via addition reactions. So we're going to take some double bonds and our monomers break those double bonds to form linkages to build our polymers. In additional higher level content, you're also going to learn about condensation reactions where we pull water molecules out from between our monomers to build our polymers. I included that here, even though this lecture is SL, because I wanted my biology friends to be able to make the connection. We talk a lot about condensation reactions in bio. All of our polymers are composed of these repeating units, again, these monomers. And the first polymer that we're going to look at is composed of the monomer ethene, and we're going to make polyethene, which is also known as PE, plastic polyethylene. We use it to make plastic bags and cups and bottles, and it's made by an addition reaction of lots and lots of ethene molecules. Remember, we talked about addition reactions in our last lecture, and we looked at addition when we had like a halogen and then we could have the heterolytic fission and then we literally just add the chlorines when we break that double bond. We're going to do the same thing here, except instead of adding a halogen, we're going to go ahead and add another ethene molecule. So here I have an ethene molecule. It's got its double bond. We're going to break that double bond, turn it into a single bond. Now, each of my carbons has only one, two, three bonds. It's missing a bond. It needs to make a fourth. If I also break the double bond of the next ethene molecule, this carbon now also has only one, two, three bonds. It needs to make a fourth bond to fulfill its octet. And what happens is that those two ethene molecules literally link together. And now we have a chain of ethenes. And we're going to continue that by breaking our double bonds, making them single bonds, and then we're going to chain and break the double, make it a single break the double, make it a single, and then we end up with these beautiful chains of ethene molecules. And notice that the repeating unit is an ethene molecule, except it's no longer ethene, it's kind of ethane, because it's a single bond instead of a double bond, but we still are going to call it polyethene, because we made it from many ethenes, even though it doesn't have those double bonds anymore. Here's another example of a polymer. This is polychloroethene. It's also called PVC or polyvinyl chloride. You've probably heard of PVC pipes. We use it quite a bit in plumbing. So polychloroethene, you can probably guess, is composed of many chloroethene molecules. But when I look at the polymer here, I don't see any chloroethene 
right? Because there aren't any double bonds yet. But we can deduce chloroethene as the monomer by looking at the repeating units within this polymer. So when I look at it, I notice that from here to here is the same as from here to here. It's probably the same as from here to here if I had a little bit more of that piece, right? So I can deduce the monomer by finding first the repeating unit. Here is my repeat. And what I'm going to do is get rid of this bond and this bond, and then I'm going to turn that middle back into a double bond. Get rid of this bond and this bond, and turn that middle back into a double bond. And then sometimes we don't always write our molecules quite so right angle-ish. If I were to take this guy and write it how I would normally write uh, uh, an alkene molecule with hydrogen and chlorine and hydrogen and chlorine, here's hydrogen here, that chlorine here, hydrogen and hydrogen are here and here. This now looks a lot like chloroethene. This is polychloroethene made from many chloroethene molecules. Let's look at another example. We're gonna take some propene molecules and make polypropene. This is also PP plastic. We use it for toys and to make bumpers on cars. In the sciences, in the medical field, we use it to build syringes and test tubes. An easy mistake, don't do what I'm about to do. An easy mistake is to pick a C and pick a C and be like, ah, I'm going to break my double bond and then link. And I'm going to break my double bond and then link. Notice that this carbon now has, oh no, one, two, three, four, five bonds. That's too many. This carbon right here also has one, two, three, four, five bonds. That's too many. This is an easy mistake to make, my friends. Don't make it. What we need to make sure that we do is to build our linkages between the double bonded carbons. So this carbon is going to connect to this carbon and this carbon is going to connect or link to this carbon. I find that it's much easier to build the linkages if we do draw our alkenes with super right angles. So I'm gonna redraw my propene like this. Here's a C, here's a C. Two H's on the first C. I'm gonna draw it super right angly. On this C, I have one H and one methyl group. So I'm gonna draw one H and I'm going to draw super right angles, one methyl group. I'm gonna do the same thing for this propene molecule. Again, my two carbons double bonded together, this one and this one. On that first carbon, I'm gonna put my two H's, two H's, super right angles. On the second carbon, I have a hydrogen and a methyl group. I'm going to draw super right angles, carbon and methyl group. So now it's super easy for me to take my double bond and turn it into a single bond, take my double bond and turn it into a single bond, and then link those guys together. Notice that my polypropene has these methyl branches. Those methyl branches are what give those PP plastics, the polypropene plastics that we put in our toys and car bumpers, all of the properties that make it so good at being a toy or a car bumper instead of a plastic bag. Let's put away our synthetic polymers, that plastic, and talk about some natural polymers for a second. Cellulose and starch are both examples of natural polymers. They occur in biological systems. Cellulose is composed of a bunch of glucose monomers. So instead of having an alkene like we have in our plastics, here we have glucose. It's a monomer of carbohydrates. That cellulose is going to get bound together, not with addition reactions, but with condensation reactions. This is known as a glycosidic linkage. Here's another, here's another. But it's super easy to see that we have these repeating glucose monomers. Same thing in our starch. 
lots and lots of repeating glucose monomers. Cellulose and starch, both components of plants. Cellulose makes up plant cell walls. Starch is the energy storage molecule of plants. And one more example of a synthetic polymer. Here's polystyrene, also known as polyphenylethene. Polyphenylethene because our monomer that makes it is right here. So I'm going to, again, break the linkages, put a double bond in between my carbons to build that alkene. I now have phenylethene, phenylethene, which can be polyphenylethene, polystyrene, also known as styrofoam, which we use to build a lot of super convenient products. Challenge though, of course, these guys are not great for the environment. So what are the properties of polymers that make them so bad for the planet? Well, they're super strong and they've got high melting points, which is also why they're so convenient for us humans. How strong and how high the melting point is going to depend partly on the chain length, how many alkenes are we gluing together, and then also what kind of monomer are we gluing? Are they just simple ethene molecules or do we have some methyl group chains, some chlorides, some phenyl groups that are adding a little bit more intermolecular force amongst those strands? Our polymers are going to form these super cool strands, but these strands are going to tangle all up and they're also going to tangle with each other. Lots of intermolecular forces are holding these strands together. This is going to increase the strength. Sometimes we'll have some nice organized crystallization occurring. Sometimes we have these cross bridges form. These help to hold the polymer together even more strongly and also helps prevent bacteria from getting into the plastics, preventing the decomposition of the plastics. So our plastics often are not biodegradable. Biodegradable means that bacteria can get to the plastic molecules and decompose them. Since these polymers have very few functional groups that bacteria are attracted to, and all of this cross-linking and these intermolecular forces leave very little space for bacteria to enter and start that decomposition. Our plastic polymers, super antibacterial, which is great if you want a plastic bag to sit in a landfill for a thousand years, not so great if you actually don't want that plastic hanging around for such a long time. And so we're trying to design more biodegradable plastics. One way that we can take a polymer like polyethene and make it more biodegradable is by adding some more functional groups that attract bacteria, like this ester group. This ester in PLA, polylactic acid plastic, is going to help to attract bacteria. We're going to have some decomposition happen quite a bit more quickly than we would in just regular old polyethene. Now, one of the challenges is that if we put our biodegradable plastics into a landfill where there isn't a whole lot of oxygen concentration, bacteria aren't going to survive, we're not going to have the decomposition that we want, and we're going to end up with plastic hanging out for a really long time. The other challenge is that sometimes we get methane as these biodegradable plastics decompose. Methane, of course, is a greenhouse gas. And so we are switching from one environmental challenge to another. And on that slightly disheartening note, we have accomplished our guiding question. We talked about how bonding and structure help us design materials like polymers. So much vocabulary accomplished. We talked about polymerization via addition reactions. We looked at how we can make polymers out of monomers, how we can take our polymers apart to figure out what monomers made them. We talked about the properties of some polymers, and then we talked about the impact, especially of synthetic polymers, plastic on our environment. Great work today.